Hello, welcome to Professor Sky's Record Review, the only first listen new music review show hosted by a French professor immediately after leaving the gym. Always a positive review. If I don't like it, I don't listen to it. So today, the album that I like that I'm going to be reviewing is by Sarah Mary Chadwick, a name which I think I got wrong 10 times when I was trying to get ready for this video. I was like, Mary Sarah, Mary Sue, Sue Mary. Anyways, it's Sarah Mary Chadwick, and the name of the album is Please Daddy. And I think what I want to do is start off with discussing how I got kind of drawn into the album in the first place. I have a, a, a weakness for albums by artists who, like, show themselves, who draw themselves on the cover. You know, like like Dylan with uh, Planet Waves, or, uh, so I gotta stop my dog from licking his foot, I hope. Um, and uh, Rock Around the Bunker by Gainsbourg. Like, often if artists draw themselves on the cover, the contents are pretty interesting, and maybe surprisingly deep and surprisingly revelatory. So the cover of this album, Please Daddy, uh, is a, I believe, a self-portrait of this artist who I'd never heard of until this morning, uh, and, and there she is. So, you know, it's an interesting cover. She's, she's naked, uh, kind of grotesque, and sort of sad and haunting, and a little bit of humor in there, maybe. I don't quite know. So that's what, what drew me into this album. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to play you the first song and tell you how it exemplifies everything that I like about this album. So right off the bat, the song is called When Will Death Come? And that indicates a lot of the thematics of the record. It's very sad. Uh, a lot of themes of death, a lot of themes of loss. I don't, I don't know anything about her. I don't know if something's happened in her life. It feels like something's happened in her life and she's singing about it. Definitely a breakup somewhere in there. Uh, a lot of ambiguous relationship towards friends and family and lovers. Um, but what you'll hear is this piano, and most of the album is piano-led. Uh, this is kind of like an arpeggiated chord, you know, do 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 almost 50s style. A little bit of flute in the background. She often adds either flute or like nice muted drums or some nice horns to, to you know, bolster up the piano. Uh, and then you'll hear her singing. And it's really her singing that is what drew me into this record. Primarily because if an artist can be if an artist can be shaky and strong at the same time, it's it's magical. I mean, I, I grew up loving Neil Young as the strongest example of this. And just any time you can have great range and be able to hit the notes you need to hit, but not always hit the notes that are expected, not always be exactly on point, I think it gives a strength. And especially when you're singing very personal songs, uh, it makes for something that I, I really appreciate and I think is underused in music. So let's listen to a little bit of the first track, uh, the shaky but strong... Uh, track When Will Death Come by Sarah Mary Chadwick. Chadwick or Hartwick? Chadwick. It's a very, very difficult name. Okay, here we go. You hear the flute, I believe, come in right here. You see? And the nice kind of like background drums, very sort of subtle drums, subtle production. Um, it's not lo-fi, but it's not overproduced either. Like a drum sound like that works perfectly. You get the sense maybe it's just a room mic or maybe two mics as opposed to anything overproduced and overly sharp. It's not, much like the cover, it's not overly sharp. Another thing about her singing that I really appreciate is the presence of her accent. Um, she said, as you heard, and then I suspect, uh, she's from New Zealand, and I really appreciate it when singers sing with their natural accents. It's funny because only like in the last three years have I started to realize what a fake and phony Mick Jagger is. And I love Mick Jagger, but just his whole like southern accent thing, it never bothered me until I, I was listening. I forget who I was with, but they were like, why is he singing in a southern accent? I'm like, ooh. <laughs> This is kind of gross. So I really like it when you can hear a singer's like honest voice in their tone. Because really what ends up happening is singers just try to sound like Americans, you know? 
uh, and they just try to have that sound and they, and they try to make it sound flat, the sort of flat American accent, the sort of Midwestern American accent. So I'm happy that someone from New Zealand is not afraid to say a word like suspeaked. Uh, at the end of the video, I am gonna give you my thoughts about New Zealand and why I've had a sort of long-standing prejudice against New Zealand that I've only really started to understand in the last two weeks. Uh, the rest of the album continues in that vein. Um, the next track is called "If uh, I'm Not Allowed in Heaven. And it, it, there's a real kind of quasi-spiritual thing on this. Um, I looked at a couple reviews of this album just in passing. I saw a couple people compare her to PJ Harvey, which I don't think makes sense. I think, if anything, she's closer to Nick Cave just in the way that she's able to play piano, have this kind of sexy darkness, and then mix it in with sort of quasi-spiritual notes here and there, which, which make it go a little bit outside of the personal and in, into the cosmic. Um, probably the worst song on the album, by the way, uh, I'm Not Allowed in Heaven. I would skip that if you're just listening for the first time, seeing if you like it. Then there's the track Please Daddy, which is the title track. Um, when I said the name of the album I was reviewing, my wife just goes, ew. Because <laughs> it, it does sound like sexual and unpleasant. Uh, you might think, based on the cover and based on a lot of the, the album track titles, that this is a sexually unpleasant album. It's not really. Uh, this is really just a searching song. I'd say it's maybe the maybe another one of the better tracks on it. Just haunting horns in the background. And she makes me want to know what she's singing about. Because she's not... She seems to be talking about her family and about these relationships. And part of the weakness of, of my own show is that I only listen one time. And I am tempted to actually buy this album to figure out more about her. Although when I looked up the possibility of buying her album, the only way you could do it is through Bandcamp and included is an erotic print by the artist. For some reason that, that scares me. I don't know if I want an erotic print because what if it's good, then I'll have to figure out some place to put it and I don't want erotic prints up in my house. I don't want to be that kind of house. Oh, well. Anyways, uh, so uh, moving on, the next track, uh, The Heart and Its Double, uh, that's where you really see her singing range because she, the, the weakness or the sort of, uh, not weakness, but the frailty that sometimes pops up in her voice is not a, a lack of talent. I think it's an artistic choice. And here you can really see her range. Um, the flute goes a little bit mad, and this is a little bit of a lull before much needed stylistic break. So, you know, when I'm working out, I'm listening to albums. At times, I, I often think, is it too samey, you know? Is it just too much of the same sound? And this next track, uh, Let's Fight, perfectly breaks it up. If the copyright goblins wouldn't burst through my chimney and attack me, picking at my neck and eyes, I would play you this song. But this, the video would just be taken off YouTube. I play two songs. So you'll just have to imagine, or better yet, go listen to the track Let's Fight. It's got this great thumping bass line and guitar. Like, the, there's no piano. Out of nowhere, there's actual guitar going on here. And it's kind of like a, not quite rockabilly, but rockabilly adjacent track. And it's all about a relationship, a bad relationship, and then saying how, you know, I, I'm not going to let you sleep. I want to wake up and fight uh, so that I can feel all right. And there's a lot of uh, irony in, in this album. A lot of times she's singing something while meaning the opposite. Another example, the last track is called um, All Lies, where she says how good, how well she's doing and how good she's feeling, um, but it's very clear that she's just lying about it. You know, I'm okay with my family. I'm okay that you left me. A very nice and smart usage of irony, which I think you see a lot and in this track here where she says she'll feel all right if we fight. Um, great verse about feeling like she doesn't have friends. This is really paired very nicely with the next track, Make Hay, in which she talks about like basically not liking people that she's with and not liking the life decisions that she's making. Uh, she seems pretty sad, pretty adrift, and she sings about that in a very effective way. Um, that, that track, Make Hay, has this great opening lyric about looking for the light and not finding it. So uh, that goes into this semi-religious undercurrent that, that is throughout the whole album. My dog just groaned. He was very upset that I'm not letting him lick his foot. Oh. The track uh, Nothing Sticks is definitely the low point in listening. Now this is the problem with doing workout, working out while doing a review, is that 
at a certain point, I'm tired of exercising. So I can't tell if I got tired of this album or if I just got tired of exercising. But this was definitely the point where I, I was like, I need a little more differentiation. And upon further re reflection, I think this album would be stronger if it had maybe one or two less tracks or if there was one more track that was a little bit more like that Let's Fight that broke up the stylistic, if I'm being kind, the atmospheric consistency, if I'm being cruel, stylistic monotony, okay? Um, but then it falls up with If I Squint, which is, the lyrics are so good, even though it's another kind of shuffling piano song, it's just great. It's got the, the great horns again, um, wonderfully, fans of the show know that I love simple, effective, well-written lyrics. Um, I'd rather fall than see you fall is one of her lyrics, and that's just, <laughs> that's just very well written. Um, and her best usage of a New Zealand accent. She says, I'll pay my penance. She says, I'll pay my penance. <laughs> very, very funny. Um, and then there's the track, My Mouth and My C Word. Now, it doesn't say C word. It's the word for female genitalia that begins with C. Uh, my, my computer, when I was taking my notes, corrected it to my mouth and my CUNY, which stands for City University of New York. I don't think it's about that. Um, and this is great because, you know, when I saw the track title again, I'm thinking, is this just going to be some weird erotic darkness? But it's not. It's about a relationship. And the line that she has that uses that title is, my mouth makes you remember and my CUNY makes you forget. That's a great line. I don't fully understand it. I think I understand it. Well-written lyrics often make you feel the first time you hear them that you intrinsically get it, but you can't explain it. And then you have to listen. So I think my mouth makes you remember and my CUNY makes you forget. I think, you know, that's sort of the idea that like the, the that whenever she has agency or autonomy or she actually speaks up and is a human being, you remember the problems with her, but then when she's just a sexual object, you forget. I don't know if that's exactly what she's saying, but it's strong, very strong, great songwriting. It's a really good album. Um, and then it ends with that track, All Lies, which I've already discussed and I like quite a bit. Um, some of her best sort of ironic story writing. So there it is. Uh, it's a very good album. I really recommend it. Um, there's a lot of good albums this week. I'm, I'm looking forward to reviewing as many as I can, although the semester started again. So now I'm going to tell you the long and tortured history of myself in New Zealand. So I've had this anti-New Zealand bias that I've only realized recently. Um, and I've been thinking about why is it? And it's also an anti-Australia bias. And I figured out what it is. You see, I'm a French professor. And when you're a French professor, the best thing you can do to help people is teach them the language and then get them to go to France. Could I, you don't know how many times I have taught people French up through the 300 level. They're, they're reading Racine. And then they're like, good news, Monsieur Payne, I'm going abroad. I'm like, oh, thank God. This is gonna be such a good experience. It's gonna finalize your language. You're gonna have such a, I'm going to Australia. Oh, that's good for you. You're gonna have a great time. Yeah, because, you know, I, I, I don't want to be too hard and, and, and be stuck like, you know, like having to speak French all the time. Yeah, no, as your French professor, I'm glad that you're not going to actually learn the language. I've dedicated my life to teaching you. So that's where my bias came from. I was so sick of people going to the Antipodes. Do, does that word exist in English? Could you please tell me in the comments? In French, Antipode is how they refer to New Zealand and Australia as the opposite side of the world. Do we call them the antipodes in English? Anyways, I've always had an anti-Australia New, Zeal New Zealand bias, partly because of that. Also, I'm a Star Wars fan. And if you were a Star Wars fan in the early 2000s, the number one thing people did was they'd say, the new Star Wars movies aren't as good as Matrix. They were wrong. And then three years later, the new Star Wars movies aren't as good as Lord of the Rings they were wrong, but it would be like this kind of nerd fight that was going on. And it, even though I liked the Lord of the Rings movies, I own them, I own the extended version. I don't know why I bought the extended version of Return of the King. That is the worst edited movie in the history of cinema. Um, but you know, I like the movies, they're fine. But I just somehow developed this anti-New Zealand feeling because of that, to the point where when the Flight of the Concords came out, all my friends were like, Sky, this is your style of humor, you're gonna love this. I was like, nah. I'll pass, I'm straight, I'm good, forget it. 
until literally a week ago. I started watching Flight of the Concords and it's delightful. <laughs> it's so funny. It's like the it's like one of the funniest shows I've ever seen. So you know, I'm an idiot, I'm a jerk. No, Walter, you're not wrong, you're just an a-hole. That's kind of my life story. So anyway, um, and a lot of it actually, uh, my, and even last night I saw Jojo Rabbit, and now I'm reviewing a New Zealand artist. So there you go. And I'm friends with a guy who also collects Smith's posters and Star Wars toys. So I'll probably have to go to New Zealand sometime to visit because I think we're the only two people on earth that collect those two things at the same time. Anyways, so there's my New Zealand thoughts. Uh, please give a listen to Sarah Beth Hawkins. Shelley, Sarah Mary Chadwick. It's a very good album. All right, until next time, for Toby and his toes, there's the camera.